uh, running things in Gen 5, uh, sorry. Uh, we are going to cover um, what is uh, syscall emulation mode, and then we will cover uh, what is M5 ops in Gen 5, and then we will use the M5 op to annotate workload and uh, run them with the uh, syscall emulation mode. And then we will also showcase how to do cross compiling uh, for the workload and run uh, different I, uh, different ISA than the host on the SE mode simulation. At the end, we will uh, talk about how to uh, do traffic generator in the uh, Gen 5 standard library and how to make your custom uh, traffic generator. So what is uh, syscall emulation mode? Well, so uh, we usually refer to syscall emulation mode as the SE mode in Gen 5. It does not model all the device in the system. It focuses on simulating the CPU and the memory system, and it only emulates Linux system calls, and only models the user mode code. An SE mode is a good choice when uh, the experiment does not need to model the OS, such as page table walk, and uh, does, uh, when it does not need to have a high fidelity model, such as it, emulation is okay, and you need a faster uh, simulation to verify something fast. However, if the uh, experiment needs to model the OS interaction, or it needs to model a system in high fidelity, then we should use the full system mode, which we uh, usually refer as the FS mode, and it will be covered at, uh, in the afternoon today in section seven. Oops, sorry. So here, uh, let's, uh, Let's run a simple example in uh, SE mode. So uh, you can go to the material uh, folder under uh, 02 using Gen 5, 03 running in Gen 5, and in the 00 SE uh, hollow row folder, you will find there's a simple SE um, Python script. And uh, we will also detour a little bit to um, like uh, to talk a little bit about um, how to, uh, what's the Gen 5 option? So uh, in this material folder here, uh, we'll have this uh, simple SE script that has a really um, that has a, a system belt, and it runs a local binary that's defined in this C file. So all it does is just print "Hello World," and in here we'll run it with uh, the command gen 5 dash re dash dash debug um, flag. equal to syscall all with the script. As you can see, uh, it does not print out the uh, log like uh, we showcased yesterday. Instead, um, it, re it redirects the sim out, uh, the log and also the error message to this sim out doc, uh, text file and also this sim error text file under the um, Gen 5 output directory. So um, this is because uh, when we run Gen 5, we uh, passed in this uh, dash re option. So, um, and dash re is uh, alias for redirecting the um, log and the error message to the sim out uh, text file and the sim error text file. And in here, we can see that uh, there's um, air, um, debug message print for all the syscall. This is because we passed in the debug flags in the uh, Gen 5 option here. And we will cover more uh, tomorrow in the debugging section. And if you're interested about uh, what um, Gen 5 uh, options there are, we can do uh, Gen 5 dash dash help to find out all the options that's available for Gen 5. As you can see here, redirect uh, standard out and redirect uh, standard ear is what we just passed in. 
And also, we can find out all the debug flag information and uh, dash da with the dash dash debug help. And uh, yeah, syscall all is here. That includes debug uh, message uh, of syscall base and uh, syscall verbose. So anyway, let's look at um, our, sys uh, our debug message for the syscall. So here, we can see that it calls a write function and prints hello row. And on the left side, this is the timestamp of the current tick of uh, when the syscall is, uh, is run. And you can see that before and after the syscall end, it has the same timestamp. So it suggests that in SE mode, we do not um, model the timing for the emulated syscall. So um, now let's jump a little bit ahead to what's M5 ops so that we can use it later for our more advanced uh, SE intro examples. So the M5 op is a um, library inside or utility inside Gen5 that provide different functionality that can be used to communicate between the simulated workload and the simulator. So there are some common use uh, functionality um, that is uh, listed here, like such as exit, work, uh, begin, work end, reset stats, dump stats, checkpoint, and switch CPU. So you can see, uh, you can find uh, all the um, Gen5 ops inside the Gen5 ops document, sorry, documentation. So um, as you can see here, we have a definition for each of the uh, Gen5 op, uh, M5 op, sorry. Um, but it's important to know, not all of the ops do what they say automatically. Most of them only access the simulation and it's uh, our job to configure to uh, perform as like we want. And for example, um, exit, like, uh, the M5 exit actually exits automatically, but for work begin and work end, it only exits if it's config in system. And for uh, reset stat and dump stat, they actually do what is said, but for checkpoint and switch CPU, it only exits. And we can see um, the Pseudo ins.cc file under the source theme uh, folder in uh, Gen5 for more detail how um, Gen5 handled this exit event automatically. And we uh, also know that when we use Gen5 standard library, there might have a default behavior for some of the M5 ops. And we can find those default behaviors under the source Python, Gen5 simulate, and simulator.py file. So more about uh, M5 ops. There is actually three different versions of M5 ops. And there's instruction mode that it only works with the simulated CPU models, such as the, um, actually the atomic CPU and the timing CPU, such as the O3 CPU inside Gen5. And uh, for the address mode, it works with the simulated CPU models and the KVM CPU. And for now, we only support the ARM and x86 KVM. And for the last one, is uh, less commonly used, is the semi-hosting uh, version that um, we are not gonna cover in the bootcamp here. But um, different modes uh, should be used depending on the CPU type and the ISA. And the address mode uh, M5op will be covered in the um, section seven full system as the Gen5 bridge and in section eight, accelerating simulation after the KVM CPU is introduced. And in this section, we will only cover the instruction mode, M5 op. So when should we use M5 op? There are two main ways of using it. One is using it to annotate our workload. The other is making Gen5 bridge calls in the disk image. In this section, we will focus on learning how to use the M5 op to annotate workloads. And stop me if you have any questions. So how do we use this M5 ops? Um, M5 ops uh, provides a, a library of functions for different functionalities. So all functions can be found under the include gen5 m5 op.h file in the gen5 directory. And 
the commonly used function is the M5 exit, M5 work begin, M5 uh, work end, those we mentioned in a field slide before. And in order to call this function in the workload, we will need to link the M5 op library to the workload. So first, we need to build the M5 op library. So all the, um, all the uh, sorry, the M5 uto, uh, utility is in the Gen5 uto M5 directory. And in order to build the M5 op directory, uh, sorry, library, we need to first cd into um, the Gen5 uto M5 directory and run this command. This scans uh, build RSA out M5 command. So uh, we also like provide interface to do a cross compile for the M5 op library. And the compiled library um, can be found under the uto M5 build and the ISA and the out directory. Note that uh, if the whole system ISA does not match with the targeted ISA, we would need to use the cross compiler. And the target ISA option here has to be lowercase. So let's try to build the M5 op library. Let's um, go, uh, let's cd to the gen5 uto m5 directory and run the scan um, command. So uh, this step is necessary for the next few exercise. So um, if you are planning to uh, do a longer exercise, uh, you might need to build this alongside um, the command here. So first, uh, we, we let's build the x86 M5 op library. So we can build it uh, with scans build x86 slash out slash M5 here. Is anyone having trouble to run this command? So next, let's cross compile uh, our ARM64 um, M5 op library. So we can pass in our cross compiler. with this um, option here. Sorry. And it will cross compile ARM64 uh, M5 pop library for us. Anyone having trouble with the cross compilation? Yes. Uh, so it scans arm64 dot cross compile uh, equals to the cross compile um, compiler and build arm64 slash out slash m5. Oh, because uh, our host is x86 and we want to build an ARM64 uh, M5 op library. That's why we need to use the cross compiler. We will cover it a bit more uh, in the cross compiler section, like uh, I think a few, li few slides after. Yeah. Then uh, now we built our um, first M5 op library. Yes. Repeat my question for everybody. Uh, can we do things other than just ARM? Oh, so uh, Jason asked, uh, can we do things uh, other than just ARM? So we do, uh, we do able to do uh, RISC-5 with the uh, correct like, uh, cross compiler. And yeah, I think. Yeah. OK. so. Next, we need to um, 
Next, we need to know how to link this compiled library to our workload. So uh, in order to link them, we need to include the gen5, uh, m5ops.h file inside our source file uh, in, of the workload. And uh, we need to add the gen5 include to the compiler's include search um, path. And we need to add uh, the bounded, uh, compiled the gen, uh, m5 opt to the linker search path. And at the end, we need to link against the lib m5.a fi uh, file, sorry, library with the dash lm5 command in the compiler command. And we will walk through how to do this. So second uh, exercise, let's annotate the workload with m5 work begin and m5 work end. So in, uh, under the material uh, O2 using Gen5, O3 uh, running in Gen5 and O2 uh, annotate uh, this folder, there is a workload source file that's called uh, O2-annotate-this.cpp and a make file there. So this, so this workload here, it mean it does two things. This is our source code of the workload. It does two things. One is it write this string to the standard output. The other is that um, it tried to read all, uh, all the file and folder names in the current directory and output them uh, to the, also the standard out. And in this exercise here, we want to, um, mark this uh, uh, right, this will be output to the standard out string as our region of inches using the m5 uh, work begin and m5 work out function. So how do we do this? So first, we'll need to include the gen5 uh, opts header file. Then we will be able to use the m5 work begin function and the m5 uh, work end function. And that's it. That's how we can uh, mark our region of inches. And then we would need to uh, link the library use, uh, using the compiler command. And uh, we can edit our um, make file here to, um, to do this simpler. So in here, we can write XX. So in this line, we link uh, the um, Gen5 include into our compiler search directory. And here, We link uh, the compile the library that uh, we just uh, compile with the ISA we want to our compile, uh, compiler search directory. And at the end, we use the dash lm5 command to um, link uh, to, to link it to the shared library. Yes. Yeah, so let's try to make this with the uh, make command. And now we got our first annotated uh, binary. And we can try to uh, run this um, by like, 
and we will find that uh, it would have this error, illegal instruction, because uh, the host does not recognize the uh, M5 op uh, instruction. So, uh, this, um, so this is also the reason why we would need to use the address version of the M5 op if we use the KVM CPU for our simulation. So here is our third exercise. We can run uh, the binary that we just annotate with a simple SE uh, script. So uh, let's go to the O3 run x86-SE uh, uh, directory, and you will find this O3, uh, sorry, 03-run uh, x86-SE.py uh, file, and we can run it with simply this command. And uh, as we piped in the um, dash re uh, command, it would uh, output all the um, log and error message to the sim uh, out and sim error uh, text file under the uh, Gen5 uh, output directory. Now let's look at the sim out uh, doc, sorry, actually the sim error uh, dot um, text file first. So we can see that uh, the, uh, the simulation recognized the M5 work begin and M5 work end uh, M5 ops function here. And it shows a, a default behavior which is uh, resetting the stats and continuing for the wor uh, work begin and dumping the stats and continuing for the work end. This is because uh, there's default behavior uh, defined for these two M5 op functions in the standard library. So uh, as mentioned before, um, all the standard library uh, defined that uh, default behavior can be uh, found under the, uh, sorry. Let me exclude this. Source uh, Python, Gen5, simulate, and simulate.py file. And in here, this is the common like what the default behavior for each uh, X events for um, in the standard library. And all of this uh, XA event is actually categorized in the XA event.py file that's next to the simulator.py file. As we can see here, that um, the standard library categorized both uh, the XA event M5 work begin instruction encounter and the uh, work begin as the XA events dot uh, work begin XA events. And we can find all the, um, the handler for uh, all of this uh, XA events under the XA event generator dot py file that's also next to it. Any question here? But we can override this default behavior with the uh, simulator parameters. So let's uh, override the uh, work begin and work end ha uh, handler behavior using the on exit event parameters in the uh, simulator uh, parameter. So uh, let's add the following to the uh, file that we just run. So this, here. Let's define a work begin 
that does not uh, reset stats. Instead, it would uh, enable a debug flag that's called execute all. Let me write this down. Still print here to indicate that it reached the handler. So uh, in here, we define the, uh, a work begin handler that prints uh, the string work, be, uh, work begin handler. And also, it used the m5.debug um, feature fe to find the uh, debug flag as a queued all, and uh, use the enable function to enable the debug flag uh, when we reach the uh, work begin handler. So let's define an, uh, a work end one that would um, disable the uh, debug flag when the work end is um, encountered. After defining this to handler, we can register it uh, using the uh, on X event parameter in the um, standard library simulator uh, uh, module with the X events type work begin. And the X event work end. Now, before we move on, uh, let's look at uh, the sim outs uh, text file that we just, uh, so uh, for the run that we just did. As you can see here, it prints out the string for the uh, write function, and also it lists out all the uh, files and uh, folder inside the uh, run directory that we ran the command. And if we run this uh, modified um, simulation again, we will see another um, behavior for this uh, log. So now in here, you can see that uh, when it in uh, when it reaches the work begin handler, it starts to print out the execute all uh, debug message. And the execute all debug flag uh, should print like all the instructions as executed, all the execution actually. Um, and in here, we find that uh, for our write, fu uh, write function, we printed out this here. And if we look at uh, the timestamp, yeah. So it just runs this call here. Oh, this one? Yeah. So now uh, we added a print that prints the get last uh, as an event calls when we get to the work begin. And we can look at the um, output file of it to see the uh, printed exit events. Uh, uh, sorry, printed exit reason, which is work begin. It's not part of the standard library.
Okay. Yeah. So uh, we can design to uh, design that if we should um, uh, fall back to the simulation or exit the simulation by passing uh, u false or u true. Yeah, u true. U true. Uh, so if we u false, uh, it will fall back to the uh, simulation and continue simulating. If we yell uh, true here, it will exit the simulation after uh, it gets, the, um, gets to the handler. Um, so uh, before uh, we moved on, I, I want to like uh, look at this uh, a uh, lock here a bit. Like uh, remember that uh, our workload uh, would actually print out all the folder file names of the current directory. So as this suggests here, uh, the SE mode actually is able to read and write the host um, directory uh, with the, perm uh, the with the permission set. It. And a little bit more tips on uh, SE mode. Uh, with the Gen5 standard library, we user use the set SE binary workload functions in the board object to set up the workload. And we can pass in files, argument, environment, uh, variable, and output file path to the set SE uh, workload function using the corresponding uh, parameters. And for more information, uh, we can look at um, the uh, Python Gen5 component board as, uh, SE binary workload PY file. Okay. Uh, any any question before we move on to cross compilation? Okay. So uh, cross compiling, which is uh, compiling uh, a uh, ISA that's different from the host ISA, like we just did uh, for the uh, ARM M5 op library. And other exercise, let's go to uh, the 04 cross compile workload uh, directory. And there, there uh, is a make file um, for the workload that uh, we just uh, compiled, but this time we're going to cross compile it to ARM64. So uh, as you can see, this source code, uh, it looks exactly like the one that we just compiled for uh, x86. So all we need to change here is that uh, we need to um, have um, static compilation uh, to compile it to ARM64 and also a dynamic one to see uh, what's the difference. So here we can fill in our compiler command. As uh, we just uh, did for the last um, exercise there, we need to link it uh, with the Gen5 uh, include folder and also the um, M5 op library because in our source code we are going to um, use the uh, M5 work begin and work end function. And this time, uh, for our uh, M5 ops here, we are using the ARM64 one instead of the x86 one. And for a static compilation, we need to add a, a static um, option flag. And for our dynamic one, the only difference is we no longer have the static flag. Any 
So we can just copy and paste the same command we wrote for the static one and remove the static flag here. So after this is done, we can uh, run the make command. Yeah, that is something that we will cover like uh, in the next example because like in dynamically uh, linked situation, we might need to redirect our library to the uh, actual like cross library in the host machine. Okay, thank Sorry, I might have a typo somewhere. Let me find it. Oh, oh, sorry. Thank you. Ah, now, now we compile this. Um, so uh, with this compile, uh, we know that uh, we now have um, two uh, ARM64 binary for the uh, workload, and one is statically compiled, the other is dynamically compiled. And let's try to run it with uh, the script and um, 05 run ARM SE here. It's a simple script that's like exactly the same as the one that we ran, but uh, now it takes in an argument to, uh, to direct us to the um, statically compiled workload or the dynamically uh, compiled workload, and also um, it's now an ARM simulation. And we can um, try this uh, with the static one first. Uh, let's uh, change our uh, output directory to static so that uh, we can compare um, the different outputs for um, the static uh, work, uh, compiled workload and the dynamic one. Sorry for uh, the last like uh, make file here. I should uh, change the name for dynamic, um, the output name for the dynamic um, compile one and the static compile one. Yeah, let me compile it again. So now, uh, as you can see, the static one um, run like. Um, ran successfully with the ARM simulation. So now try, uh, let's try the dynamic one. The dynamic one is actually having an error here that is failed to open the library for the uh, ARM64 um, shared library. 
So, uh, what we, uh, so what we need to do here is that we need to redirect the library path to the actual um, uh, cross-compiled cross library in the host. So in our um, GL5 run ARM SE simulation file here, we need to define that when the uh, workload is dynamic, we need to redirect it um, to our um, to to the actual uh, cross compiler library. So in here, oh, we will need um, two things from M five to actually do this. One is the redirect path object from uh, um, actually it's a, a redirect path object, and the other is the uh, set interdirect object. And we need to uh, set the uh, interdirect object with the path um, to the actual uh, ARM64 library here. And also uh, pipe in the redirected path to the board using the dot, uh, the redirect path uh, parameters in the board. So now with this setup, let's run the dynamic uh, compiled workload again. Sorry, this is something wrong. So in here, you can see that uh, it now is able to um, successfully run the simulation with the redirected path. So a uh, summary of uh, all the topics that we covered, and uh, like I think most importantly, is that we need to remember that SE mode does not implement uh, many things, including the file system, most of the system calls, I.O. device interrupts, TLB misses, page table walks, contact switches, and multiple, uh, multi -thre uh, multiple threads. So you can run it, but um, it's not suggested. Cool. All right, um, so hi everyone. We're gonna talk a little bit about traffic generation and specifically traffic generation in Gem 5. 
So just to quickly introduce what synthetic traffic generation is, it's a technique for driven memory subsystems without requiring the simulation of processor models and running workload problems. So when we're talking about synthetic traffic generation, we want to think about two things. It can be used for measuring maximum theoretical bandwidth and testing correctness of a cache coherency protocol, but it cannot be used for measuring the execution time of a workload, even if we have the memory trace. So we can see a few patterns with synthetic traffic generation, like sequential, strided, and random. And um, now we're going to take a look at how traffic generation works in Gem5. So you guys have already seen the standard library early in, earlier in the boot camp. Um, so it has a collection of components for generating synthetic traffic. All of these components inherit from abstract generator, which is found in this file path. So we can take a quick look at it right now. So it's just source, Python, Gem5 components, and processors. So if we look in that folder, Okay, so we see a lot of different generator types on the, the side over here, if everyone can see. And we'll talk a little bit more about the generator cores and like the linear generator and random generator. So we're going to see how linear generator and random generator simulate a memory subsystem. And um, our first coding exercise, we already have prepared a subsystem with a cache hierarchy of a private L1 cache and a shared L2 cache. And we're going to be working with one channel of DDR3 memory. So um, if we go back to the, to the files that we were looking at earlier, if, you if we open up linear generator.py or random generator.py, we're going to see a constructor that has a set of parameters that kind of um, help us customize how we want our synthetic traffic generator to work. So you guys can take a look at it on your own time. Um, so you might have seen that there were a set of parameters. We're just going to talk a little bit about what those parameters mean. So a few important ones to look at are the num cores, min address, and max address, along with block size. So min address and max address are essentially like a range on uh, what memory you want to access. Like your min address is the minimum address and your max address is the maximum address. Um, the block size is kind of like a step size where it shows on how you're going to access that memory. Um, and then num cores is the number of cores in your system. There's a few other parameters that we can talk, uh, that you guys can look uh, at a little bit more later, but these are kind of the ones that will help us visualize how traffic generation happens. So the main traffic generators that we're the main yeah the main traffic generators that we've been talking about have been linear and random. So we want to look at how they access memory. So here we have an example where we have a min address of zero and a max address of four with a block size of one. Linear essentially means sequential, so it so memory would be accessed um, in a pattern where you go zero, one, two, three because we've identified one block size and that's our range. Meanwhile, random, there's no organization to it. It kind of just depends randomly. So in this case, we've chosen an example of um, address one is accessed, then address three is accessed, then two, then zero. So does anybody have any questions so far about traffic generators in Gem5 or about the linear and random generator? Okay, cool. Um, so now we're going to start programming a little bit. So um, we're going to go ahead and open up this file path. So it's just in the materials section, um, O2 using Gem5. We've been using this a lot today. Um, they have O3 running in Gem5. And then if you guys can pull up O6 traffic gen. So I'll give everybody a second to pull up that line of code, or that, that file. So we were in 04 earlier, and 05, we're going to be going to 06. Has everybody been able to pull up simple traffic generators.py, or is anybody having any confusions? Okay, good. So if you take a look at the import statements, you'll see some of the things that we talked about earlier. So the cache hierarchy that we've decided to use, the um, single channel DDR3 memory, 
Um, and then we mentioned that you can find the linear generator, random generators, and other generators in that um, standard library as well. So we've already set up the cache hierarchy, we've already set up our memory, and we have a board that's ready to go. All we need to do is uh, write our generator. So, yeah. Um, it's very, it's pretty simple to call a generator. Um, this is essentially just the line that you have to put into simple traffic generators.py. So, I'm gonna go ahead and put my generator right here. I just copied it from the slides. And we talked a little bit about how some of the parameters, um, on the parameters that were mentioned in the constructor, we already have set values for them, but this is if you wanted to change them. So here we've chosen to change the number of cores and the rate. And that is pretty much it. So we're gonna look at how to run this. Okay, so we wanna CD into the directory that um, we're running traffic generation in. Oh, I guess. If, you, if everybody's in the other directory, I probably want to go one or two directories back. I'm just going to restart it. I don't know where I am. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, and then once you're in the directory, it's very straightforward to run the simple traffic generators.py script. We have a few debug flags, and we're running with our rebuilt gem5 binary. <clears throat> okay. Was everybody able to add the generator in the Python script and be able to run it and get an output that looks like this? Or is anybody having any trouble? Okay, good. So um, we're going to go ahead and take a look at our output and what our output means. So I'm going all the way to the top about where the command was run. So we got a, a few extra lines of output. So I'm gonna go back to the slides actually. So this is the output that we're seeing. Um, we're seeing a lot of R2 address blank. So this means that the traffic generator is simulating, simulating a read request to access memory address blank. So we're running the linear gen, oh, and also these addresses are supposed to be in hex, so they're not 0, 40, 80, they're 0, 64, and 128. Um, so we talked a little bit about how the linear generator means that the accesses are done sequentially. So you'll notice that we see a pattern where we're going to address 0, and then to address 64, and then to address 128. If we were running the random generator, which it's very simple to do, it's just replacing that line of code with, instead of linear generator, we just put random generator we would see uh, a lot more of a random pattern, like there would essentially be no pattern because there's no order to how, me how memory is being accessed. So that was our first time running a, a traffic generator in Gem5. We're gonna talk a little bit about how the generators are all associated with each other. So linear generator and random generator are almost identical except for how they access memory, like the order on how they access memory but they all inherit from the abstract generator class. And we'll, if you look through the folder, the processors folder, you'll find a few other generators, and later we'll be working on a new generator that's also pretty similar. And um, if we, let's take a quick look at the abstract generator constructor. Because we'll find like, how all the other generators inherit from it. So, um, yeah, so here we have our abstract generator um, constructor. This is also in the same um, folder that we talked about earlier. So. Uh, a lot of classes that extend abstract generator core and they'll create synthetic traffic using a sim object called pi, called pi traffic gen. And for more information, you can look at this file path, source CPU testers traffic gen. Um, and when, if I were to go back to here, so you'll see that we have linear generator and basically it, um, it, it can have multiple linear generator cores and likewise, a random generator would have multiple random generator cores. 
So next, we're going to look at extending abstract generator to create a hybrid generator that has both linear generator and random generator cores. So GEM5 has a lot of tools in its standard library, but in your research, if you want to simulate a specific memory access pattern, there might not be anything in the standard library to do this. Um, in this case, you'd have to extend abstract generator to create a generator that would fit your needs. Um, in this boot camp, we will go through an example called hybrid generator. The goal of hybrid generator is to simultaneously simulate both linear and random memory accesses. Um, to do this, we will need both linear generator cores and random generator cores. So, a quick aside about linear generator cores, if you remember, linear generator cores simulate linear traffic. If we have multiple linear generator cores uh, and each one is configured the same min address and the same max address, then each one will start simulating memory accesses at the same min address and same max address. Or in other words, each one will be accessing the same addresses at like the same time. Um, this is not wrong, but if we want linear generator cores to simulate a more reasonable access pattern, um, we will need to have linear generator cores accessing different chunks of memory. So to do this, we will split up memory into equal sized chunks and configure each linear generator core to uh, simulate accesses to one of these chunks. Um, here's a diagram to show how it will look visually. Um, here you can see um, the linear generator cores on the left, um, they are configured to simulate accesses to one, to one chunk of the given memory address range, and all of these accesses are happening in parallel, so each linear generator core is doing their accesses in parallel. Um, when we get to the code, we'll be using a function called partition range. Um, you can find this function in abstract generator.py, which was shown earlier, but we will get to this later. Um, the next thing to keep in mind is the random generator cores. It's very reasonable to assume we would do the same thing for the random generator cores, but this is not the case. Since random generator cores um, um, simulate accesses in a random pattern, they're not going to be simulating the same addresses at the same time. They're just going to be doing random addresses. This is the full diagram of how it will look. You will see the linear generator cores on the left. They're, um, they're configured to have their own min and max address. And on the right, you'll see the random generator cores, and they'll be simulating accesses to random addresses within the range of min and max address. Um, one last note before I open the room for questions is we know how each core will access memory. So now we need to determine the distribution of linear generator cores and random generator cores. Um, there's a lot of correct ways to do this. We will be using this function here, but there's a lot of right ways to do this. Um, the rest of the cores will be random generator cores. Any questions before we start getting to coding? Okay, sweet. Um, so let's open the code. It will be under materials, under O2 using gem5, O3 running in gem5, O6 traffic gen, and then components we will be opening hybridgenerator.py. Um, have people been able to open this? Okay, sweet. <laughs> so the first thing you'll see is the constructor for hybrid generator. A quick side note I want to make about this constructor is that you can choose which parameters to expose. So like, let's say you want the duration to always be one millisecond. What you can do is you can um, you can, ah, you can delete this line and configure it so that it's always, in, so that it's always initialized with one millisecond. We won't be doing this, but this is something that you can do. Okay. So when you're creating a traffic generator, the goal of the traffic generator is to return a list of cores to use in your board. Um, in Gem5, the standard is to have a function called create cores. Um, you don't have to do it this way, but we will be using this function called create cores to do this. Um, if you go to create cores, you will see that it returns a list of linear generator cores and random generator cores. 
The next thing you'll see here is this get num linear cores function. This is the function we will be using to get the number of linear generator cores. So the first step we're going to take in coding is we're going to initialize some important variables. So the first thing, the most important variable, is the core list to return. So I'm going to initialize a core list, an empty core list. The next thing I want to initialize is the number of linear generator cores. I'm going to call it num linear cores. And I'm going to initialize it using this function here. So get num linear cores, and the input will be num cores. It'll take num cores and return the number of linear uh, cores that you will need in your system. Um, as mentioned earlier, the number of random cores will just be the remaining cores. So num cores minus num linear cores. Sweet. We've initialized some important variables. Next, let's um, get the address ranges for the linear generator cores. I mentioned earlier that we will be using a function called partition range. This can be found in abstract generator. Um, it takes in the parameter min address, max and max address, and it'll partition this range into this many uh, equal length pieces. So, so, for example, let's say that, let's say that min address equals zero and max address equals four and the, num, the number of linear cores is two, per se. Um, then address, then partition ranges or partition range will return the following, um, the following list. So it'll be a list of tuples, um, where each tuple is the range for each linear generator core. So in this example, this is what address ranges would be. Linear generator core will access these addresses, and um, linear, generator core, linear generator core two will access this range. Okay. The next thing I'm going to do is we're going to actually start adding linear generator cores to our list. Um, I'm going to use a for loop. So for i in the range of the number of linear generator cores. Ah, sorry. Too used to see. Um, we will append a linear generator core to our list. Um, each linear generator core will be initialized with the same parameters that the hybrid generator is initialized with. So these values, there's a long list of them, and I'm going to type them all out. So we have duration, we have rate, we have block size. We have, for now, I'm going to leave min address blank, and I'm also going to leave max address blank. We'll come back to it. And then there's read percent. And finally, data limit. So for min address and max address, if you remember, we talked about how each linear generator core should be configured to, um, to, access, to simulate accesses to one chunk of the given memory address range. Um, in order to do that, we have this address ranges um, variable to give each linear generator core some range. So for example, in this, or in this example rather, linear generator core zero, the min address would be zero, or yes, <laughs> the min address would be zero, and the max address would be two, and for linear core, generator core one, the min address would be two, and the max address would be four. So in order to to make that more general, what we will say is that min address will be i0, and max address will be i1. 
one. So we take the ith tuple, and the first value in that tuple will be the min address, and the second value in that tuple will be the max address. Um, any questions about that? Oh, yeah, what's up? Sorry, what was that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but yes, <laughs> thank you. Yes, I will also add the commas, thank you. <laughs> OK, the next thing we will do is we will do the same thing, but for the random generator cores. We will add them to our core list. So for i in range of the number of random cores, we will append a, ran a random generator core with, with the same parameters. So I'm just actually going to copy and paste this section. The only thing that will change is the min address and the max address. As mentioned previously, the, um, the random generator cores we'll be able to access the whole given address range. We don't have to do this partitioning. Okay. So the last thing we have to do, um, okay. What? A comma, okay. 181. Oh, thank you. <laughs> The last thing we have to do is we have to return our list of cores. And that is the end of hypergenerator.py. Um, let's, go, let's go back to simple traffic generators.py, the, the file that Siley was working with. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to import our hybrid generator. So from components, which is this folder right here, dot um, hybrid generator, which is the file name of our hybrid generator, we're going to import the class name, which is hybrid generator again. <laughs> and then here, instead of a linear generator, we're going to have a hybrid generator. And I am going to choose to initialize it with six cores. Okay, that's all. I'm going to run this now. Um, the command should be at the top of the file, over here. And as you can see, um, it's a little hard to see, but Cores zero, one, 0 through 3 are linear generator cores. You can see core 0, linear gen. And then cores 4 and 5 are random generator cores. I'm trying to find a 4. There's here. So, so we've done it. We have a hybrid generator that simulates both linear and random um, memory accesses. The last thing I want to do is um, I want to show you some of the statistics. You can see um, the difference between the data caches for the linear generators and the random, or linear generator cores and the random generator cores. Um, if you type the following command, it'll be grep read request um, dot misrate. It's, sorry, it's a, little, <laughs> it's a long command. Um, and then colon colon processor. And the file is the stats file in M5 out. You can see that for cores 0 through 3, which were the linear generator cores, the miss rate is around 13%. And then for the random generator cores, the miss rate was about 87%. And this is just because of locality. For the linear generator cores, the accesses are linear. So these caches are able to take advantage of locality in a way that the random generator core caches cannot. Um, in summary, we talked about two different types of traffic generators, random and linear. Um, linear generators simulate linear memory accesses and random 
simulate, simulate random memory accesses. We looked into how to configure a board that simulates these traffic generators, uh, that uses these traffic generators, and we also extended the abstract generator class to create a hybrid generator, which performs linear and random memory accesses. Um, and finally, we saw some of the statistical differences between these two cores. Thank you so much. Um,